a bit. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we've heard a lot in the last, I don't know, it's been over a month probably that Trevor's been announced and we've been praying about this meeting with Dell Jenkins. Uh, I'm not going to give a long introduction right now. We want him to get into his lesson. Uh, this is all information from 2019. And as all of you know, since 2019, everything's changed. But uh, he has written over 50 books and he has worked with a congregation that started with just about that many people and has grown to over 500. Um, his heart and his passion is also with helping me, <laughs> helping preachers. Him and his brother started the Jenkins Institute in honor of their family, family ancestry and how their father loves helping younger preachers. And he did that throughout his whole time here on earth. And so they help younger preachers. I want to start by thanking Trevor for all the work that you did to gather together this gospel meeting. And I also noticed um, Willie was doing some work up here yesterday, too. The building is a lot cleaner because of you. Thank you, brothers. And now, Dell Jenkins. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Zane. It is an honor to be with you. You'll hear me say that several times this week. I am delighted to be here, and thank you for all the kindnesses extended to me in, uh, in, in getting me here. Uh, it was doubtful, you know, all along the way, and then last night I get on a plane about 8 uh, o'clock in, in, in Dallas, flying from Nashville to Dallas, and then from Dallas to Springfield last night, and everything's going wonderfully, wonderfully well. Uh, we pull off from the gate a few minutes early, actually. Everything's great. We get to the runway, and we just kind of sit. We sit, and we sit a long time, an unusually long time. But I was kind of happy about it because I was watching the Alabama game <laughs> on my iPhone, which I but I was watching it, and, uh, and I know I wasn't supposed to, and I'm sure the plane might have crashed. If you're white, I don't know how a phone can do that. But so I'm watching the game, and and a few minutes later we start moving again. I thought, okay, good, we're gonna get going now. And uh, we're not moving real fast, like on a runway. And so after a couple of minutes, we pull back up to the gate. <laughs> and I thought, oh me. Well, the pilot had inadvertently misplaced or left or had his his flight log taken away from him. And so he didn't have his flight log. So he had to get that, you know. So we ended up, we got here though. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, good to be in this little town. I look forward to getting uh, to know you and uh, hopefully this will be a blessing. When I got to my room last night, there was a lovely basket of some, some good kind things in there and I hadn't had supper and it was 1 a.m. in the morning. That's a good time to eat supper. So I had a couple of those and there was a lovely card in the basket. And it said a number of very kind things, but one of the things it said was that you're looking forward to this meeting to jumpstart activity of this family. You know, it has been a very odd 20 months or so. I don't tell you anything new in telling you that. And, uh, but I do want to tell you that, that uh, God has blessed His people. And what a great thing to be together, isn't it? Hopefully, if nothing else from this, many of you have learned, like many of my friends have, that we treasure time with God's family. We can watch a screen and we can worship that way. I used to say in a sermon, this building we could do at home. We sometimes use Hebrews 10, 25, and we say, not forsake the assembly ourselves together as a manner some is. And then sometimes... I'll hear a brother pray, God, we pray that our only purpose in coming together today is to worship you. And every time I hear that prayed, I want to interrupt the guy praying. I want to say that's not a true statement. Because Hebrews 10, 25 has an A part and a B part. A part is, not forsake the assembly of yourself together as a man or some is. A B part is, but exhorting one another and so much more, the more as you see the day approaching. If you come to church and all you do is worship, you've not done everything Hebrews 10 says. You're also to exhort each other. And surely the last 18 to 20 months has taught us the value and beauty of encouraging each other. And it's my hope and desire that these next few days can be an encouragement to you. Uh, I want to say a few things getting started. Sunday morning 
Bible class of a gospel meeting for years to me was the most awkward time that could possibly exist. I, I only know one person in this building before this morning. And uh, I, I just, Zane's the only person I knew before I came in. You don't know me. You don't know anything about me really other than what Zane has told you or what maybe you read online and some of that's good and some of it may not be as good. You know, you know how online is. You, 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 you don't know me. And you don't know what I'm going to preach like. And you don't know my love and devotion to the church. And you don't know my desire to be true to the Word of God. And you don't know the fact that my greatest desire is to help the church be healthy and to grow to be more like God wants it to be. You don't know the investment I've made in, I'm sorry, that gets very personal, doesn't it, in, in my life to striving to help the church grow. You don't know that I want to do my very best in these next few days. And that I know the challenge of a meeting. The challenge of a meeting is that you come in, well, let me tell you a story if you don't mind to illustrate this. When I was living in the small town of Hamilton, Alabama, 35 years ago, I was helping build some stairs out of a Christian camp there that went up the side of a hill. The kids always slide down that hill in the mud, so instead we built stairs to go up it. And while we were building it, I really wasn't building. I was really just there for uh, entertainment's sake, I think. Carpenters, I was just there to help out. And I asked this, this father and son down in Alabama, Gene and Eugene. That's a good name for father and son in Alabama, isn't it? Gene and Eugene. I said... Uh, Tell me about the guys that preached here before I was here. And they started talking about uh, W.T. Allison and Edsel Burleson and Levi Sides and some of the men that were there. And then they said, when I would dream of the Burleson and Burleson, guy, what was his name? The older man, Gene said. And Eugene said, no, there wasn't a guy there. And then you, his dad, Gene, said, yeah, there was a guy. And they argued for 10 minutes. And what they argued about was not what his name was, but whether or not he even existed, that's not the guy I want to be. Now let me explain that a little bit. In a gospel meeting, you can say so much and push so hard, debate so intently that people think that you're the church somewhere you're not trying to pull it. Or you can say so little that years now you'll wonder, what was that guy's name? And you'll argue about whether I was in here or not. I don't want that to be the case. I want the next few days to make some impact on this congregation and on your life. Because if not, why are we here? So let's talk today about great gospel meetings. Because that's really where we're all this when we talk about, about getting together. When you don't know me and I don't know you. And what is our intent and what is our desire. So this is a class we're going to treat it as that. And I'll tell you, this is the oddest lesson of any lesson I present ever anywhere I go. Uh, so if you think it's odd when I'm done, please bear with me. Uh, this is a little different, and I'm aware of that. Uh, I ask your patience with me and forbearance with me and treat this as, as a class. So I want to ask you, uh, how many of you have been a part of this congregation for longer than five years. Raise your hand if you've been... How many of you have been part of this congregation longer than... Keep your hands up, if you will. Longer than 10 years. Leave it up if you've been longer than 10 years. Longer than 15 years. Longer than 20 years. This congregation is 105 years, 106 years old, I think. Why are you here that long? 104? <laughs> How many, how many have been a part of it more than 30 years? More than 40 years? All right, more than 50 years. All right, we're getting down to a few folks now. All right. So whether you're part of this congregation or you moved, to another, moved here from somewhere else, what is the best gospel meeting that you've ever had? And what made it that way? What's the best gospel meeting you ever remember and what made it that way? I've got all day. <laughs> One for me was Brad Harris came in some years back and he did a lot of science stuff. 
drew you into that. So part of a great gospel meeting is you want lessons that are challenging to you in some way. All right? John McMath. He's old scalawag, isn't he? John McMath. I've known John. <laughs> I've just kind of sped mine up a little bit. All right. John's a great guy. He and Angela are dear, dear friends of ours. What do you what made John such a good meeting preacher for you? All right. Very good. So I want to promise you that I will not be the greatest preacher you've ever heard. I'm aware of that. I'm well aware of that. I will not be as good a preacher as you have on Jesus. I hope you love your minister. And I hope you encourage him. And that is so very vital in the life of a church that that, that relationship be a team relationship. I won't be, the, the sermons won't be the greatest sermon you've ever heard. I wish they'd be better. I, will, I try all the time to be better, better at what I do. I'm not being pitiful in that. I just want to be the best I can be. It won't be the best sermons you've ever heard. But you know, I don't believe sermons what make, makes a great gospel meeting. If you look back on this gospel meeting, what in your mind would assure you that you remember this was a great gospel meeting? What would assure you of that? Change, okay. Anybody else? We're Christians. There's a real simple answer to this one. Oh, there it is. <laughs> when I pulled up, I noticed a Methodist church right across the street. I thought maybe I came to the wrong one anyway. But <laughs> It's right here, isn't it? I mean, if after this meeting is over, there have been... Three people baptized? About five. Or ten. Even one. Even one. Yes, sir. The water's warm. Any crickets in it? Any crickets in it? <laughs> I'm from Alabama. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. So, the key to great gospel meeting is not the sermons. Though the sermons have a part of it. And we'll get to that key in just a minute. In this lesson, in a few minutes, I'm going to say one sentence that if you're like I am, when I heard this sentence, it changed everything about my life when it came to church. One sentence. And if you're like I am, when I was younger, I used to think when a preacher says something like that, I used to think, well, why don't you just say that sentence and sit down? That'd be a lot easier on all of us. Well, we're going, to be, we're going to take a while to get there. Have you ever thought how simple is in? The beef about this lesson will be that it's simple. But I want you to remember today that simple does not necessarily mean simplistic. It's going to be simple, but not simplistic. One sentence. Have you ever thought how simple is in? you ever thought how God made things simple? In the beginning, a man or woman put him in a garden in a perfect place and said there's one rule. Don't eat of the tree. Simple, right? And then man sins. And God immediately, even before time began, Ephesians says, but Genesis 3 gives us the proto-evangelica, the first gospel, how Satan would bruise the heel of God, but Christ would bruise His head, would, would destroy Him, basically. You, the, the simple thing, I mean, you ever thought how simple the gospel is? You ever thought how simple it is? 1 Corinthians 15, how Jesus died, was buried according to the Scriptures, and rose again the third day. How Romans 6 kind of reenacts that in our own death, burial, and resurrection, and baptism. In fact, if you're like I am, the challenge you had with your children growing up was not getting them to be baptized, but getting them to wait until you thought they were old enough to be baptized. Right? I was six the first time I told my dad. 
I want to be baptized. We've had Brother VP Black in for a gospel meeting. Man, he preached. And I was convinced I was lost. I needed to be baptized. And I went to my dad. You know what dad said? A local preacher for 43 years in Birmingham, Alabama. He said, you're too young. Well, a year later, on my seventh birthday, I went back to him. I said, Dad, I'm ready to be baptized. You know what he said? You're too young. He added something to it. Your brother's not even been baptized yet. I don't want you to be baptized for your brother. So that year I became a soul winner. And during that year I convinced my older brother to be baptized. And then the next year on my eighth birthday was a Sunday. I woke my mom and dad up at 6 a.m. I said, I'm eight years old. I'm ready to be baptized today. You know what dad said? You're too young. So that afternoon, I called a meeting of the elders. <laughs> I was trouble early. <laughs> and I said, I want to be baptized. My dad won't let me. I was baptized later that day. I've got a grandson. His name's Lucas. Lucas was, was four. His sister Holly was three. And his mom and dad said, called and said, hey, uh, would you and Melanie, that's my wife, would y'all like to watch the kids for a while? We want to go out on a date. And we said, we'll get back with you on that. No, we didn't say that. We said, of course we would. And so we drove to their house in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. And Laura, my daughter-in-law, is giving Lucas and Holly instructions before they leave. And she gets down on Lucas's level and looks him in the eye and says, now Lucas, while you're gone... Don't baptize your sister. <laughs> He's baptizing all his Sesame Street characters in the bathtub. Except for Count. He doesn't believe in baptism for the dead, apparently. He's got that passage figured out. I still don't have it figured out. But he's got it figured out. That's how simple the Gospel is, isn't it? I mean, it's so simple that, that I was... I was born on a Monday and was in church on Wednesday. And by the time I was six, I'd heard the gospel presented hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times already. It's not shocking that I knew I needed to be baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. Simple. Worship. You ever thought how simple it is? In 1991, I went to Dnepropetrovsk in the Ukraine, the former Soviet Union to a city of two million people, there was not a church there. And that week we baptized, the first week we were there, we baptized two people. And the church met for the first time on the Sunday after we'd gotten there the previous Saturday. And you know what they did? They sang. They prayed. They studied the Word of God. They partook of communion. And they gave of their means. Anywhere you go in the world. I was stranded in an airport in Antigua several years ago. The plane was full. There was a mom and a child that wanted to go together and they were going to be separated. I said, I'll give up my seat. I'm real noble like that, you know. You've got to show you how humble I am, right? I thought, you know, it kind of be fun to hang around Antigua another day or two. So that's really the truth. I'd forgotten it was Sunday morning. I was stranded in an airport with no taxi, no ride or anything. And there was one little store open. You know what they had? Juice and crackers. Anywhere in the world. You can take the Lord's Supper. You can worship. How simple is it? Man come along has come along and complicated it all. Whether there are additions and ideas and traditions and ideologies and it's got to be done this way or in this order or in that way that is apart from the commands of God, that's where we get in trouble. Simple. Church? How simple is, is the church? A group of people who love God, who want to obey the greatest command, love each other, and who come together to worship. Simple. 
We mess it up, don't we? With personalities and issues that come up and arguments over stuff, sometimes important but seems silly on the grander scheme of things if we think about it. I mean, it's simple, isn't it? Simple, isn't it? You think of salvation. I love 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, how the Son of Glory left the riches of heaven and came and dwelt among us. The text says, though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might be made rich. It's simple. Have you ever thought how we say things? I'm from the South. Y'all may not do it here in Oklahoma, but we say things in the South all the time that we don't mean. Okay? Ever do it, you know? Hey, y'all come see us. I don't, do y'all do that here? You don't see y'all probably, but y'all come see us. You don't want them to come see you, do you? You're just being nice. Y'all come eat supper with me. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Well, I didn't really mean it. I just inviting you, okay? 1980, I was a freshman at Freed Hardeman. I met Monday John Akapakapan. Monday John was not from Oklahoma or from Alabama or from Tennessee. He was from Nigeria. Studying to be a gospel preacher, Monday John and I became friends. And so Monday John and I, one night we're going to go get a bite of supper in Jackson, Tennessee from Henderson, Tennessee. Before we left town, we had to get some gas. I stopped at a gas station. We went inside. Going to get us a cold drink before we left, a Coke before we left. And so we go inside to pay for the gas. And you couldn't pay at the pump in those days, obviously. And so we're inside. We get us a cold drink. I pay for the gas. I head back to the car. The sweet little girl behind the counter says, y'all come back now. And I get to the car. I pump my gas and all. And Monday's not with me. I think, well, he started talking to that girl inside. So I pump my gas. I put the gas thing back in. I go back inside the store to get Monday. And he's talking to that girl behind the counter. And we visit for a couple of minutes. And I say, Monday, we need to go. And he says, okay. And we head out the car. And after leaving, she says, y'all come back. And I go to the car. I get my key out. I didn't have a fob in those days. I put it in the door. Notice Monday's not with me. Some of you are already ahead of me, aren't you? Monday's not with me. I get back in the store. I'm thinking in my mind, I'm not that smart. I'm thinking in my mind, he likes this girl. He's going to ask her out on a date or something, you know, because he sure is talking to her a whole lot. I say, hey, Monday, if we're going to make it back and have supper and make it back in time for curfew, we need to get going. And he said, okay. And we head to the car and she says, I'll come back now. We say things all the time we don't mean. Now, for the lesson to go forward, I need two volunteers. You are going to have a very easy job. There's only one thing important in this volunteer work I'm going to ask of you. You're not going to have to come down front or anything. You're going to have to stand up and you have to answer one question. The only requirement is that you have to like to eat. So I need two volunteers. Unbeknownst to me. Okay. And you're author, right? No, Harley. Harley. Can I call you author? Is that all right? <laughs> you're author, right? You're author? Okay, Arthur. <clears throat> so there's a place down in Alabama. Okay. Or excuse me, down in, down, yeah, down in Alabama. It's called Big Springs Cafe Number Two. You ever been there? Okay. They have the greatest hamburger in the world. I can't describe it to you. Now, I know this is going to be foolish to some of you, but please bear with me. It's unbelievable how good it is. I mean, it's, it's the, the place is in a trailer. It's been there at least 50 years. That's how long I've been going there. It's in a trailer. There's a bait and tackle shop right next door to it. The front door has a big crack in it. It's been that way forever. The glass has a crack in it. But they open at 11. You've got to get there before 11 because there'll be a line outside at 11 o'clock. And when they're out of burgers, they're out of burgers. They don't sell cheeseburgers, just hamburgers. You can order a hamburger with cheese, but don't order a cheeseburger. I don't really understand that. But you, they're, they're the size of a crystal, okay, but with real meat on them. They don't serve Coke or Pepsi. They serve Boba Cola, and they have fries. That's all that's on the menu. 
Best hamburger. They, I mean, you will never eat a burger that in your life. How's that sound to you? I'd like, I'd like for you to go with me, okay? All right. Have a seat. Thank you. That wasn't that hard now, was it? Thank you, Harley. All right. Now. <laughs> For the life of me, I cannot remember your name. Carl. Carl. I was going to say Bob, so I wasn't even close, but I was one letter off. <laughs> Carl, thank you for volunteering. Have you ever been to a place called Brooksy's Barn? Okay. <laughs> Brooksy's Barn is a buffet in Jackson, Tennessee on Oil Well Road. It's, it may be the greatest restaurant on earth. I mean, it is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be buried there. Because someday I'm going to die eating there. I'm sure. So just go ahead. It, it, they have they have. It's a buffet. They have whatever kind of meat you can imagine. They have ribs, dry, wet. You know. I mean, they have fish. They have the best fried chicken I think I've ever had in my life. I think put some kind of extra sugar in the batter or something. It's marvelous. They have sweet tea. You know what that is, don't you? Southern sweet tea. Uh, they have southern sweet. You know. This isn't an interview, it's a lecture. <laughs> so Carl, they have good southern sweet tea. You know what southern sweet tea is, okay? Southern sweet tea is tea that has so much sugar in it that if you accidentally knock the cup over while you're eating, you can pick it back up before it spills out. It's got that much sugar in it, okay? They have, they have this thing, it's, it's like a hush puppy, but they take it and they put it in sugar and then in pineapple and they roll it around. And it's just like a little, if they're not in heaven, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, that's not true. But they are marvelous, marvelous. I mean, it's the best one. Not cheap, but it's, it's really good. Now, now this is where your job, Brother Carl, becomes very important. Okay? I go the first Monday in February at 4.30 p.m. They open at 5, but I go at 4.30. Okay? How would you like to go with me? I'd like to go with Have a seat. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have a great gospel meeting, right? Some of you, I don't want to be ugly to you, of you some not to you, but some of you don't care. Uh, you'll, you'll exhibit that by not being back tonight or any other time. And I'm not being ugly to you in that. You, if you cared, you would be here, unless you have some reason that keeps you from being here that is legitimate, not something like, you know, uh, my favorite team was playing football or something. I mean, something legitimate. If you're a doctor and you've got to work or you have employment that you've got to be at. I'm not being ugly to you, but if you care, you make an effort to be here. You'll sit at home or you'll go watch a ball game, a little league game or something, and you'll say, that's more important to me than this. So some of you care, and you'd like to have a great gospel meeting. You'd love to see one or three or five or ten folks become Christians. I'd love to see that as well. You'd love to see the church encouraged and built up, and that's, you'll make an effort to be here. But I want to tell you, if we're going to baptize anybody in this meeting, I have little to do with it. And I want to tell you why. I know one person that lives in this town. <laughs> whose name I can't pronounce. I can pronounce his name, but I can't pronounce the name of the town. What is it? Miami. Miami. Okay. That. If I get that wrong, I apologize, Bob. I'm bad at names. So, I don't know anybody that lives here. And we'll not baptize somebody as a result of this meeting that's not here. But you do. You work with people. You play with people. Your kids are involved in their lives. You walk with them. They've been your friends for years. They're your family members. You know them. And we can't teach them unless they're here. It just can't happen. Now, 
I'm going to tell you something that I haven't told Travis, Trevor. <laughs> See? <laughs> I haven't told Trevor and I haven't told Zay. They pick the lessons we're going to present here. The elders pick the lessons we're going to present here. Hold that thought for just a minute. When I was living in Hamilton, I moved there and I went to every business in town my first week there. And I'd go in and I'd say, I'm Bill Jenkins, I'm the new preacher at the Hamilton Church of Christ, I just wanted to meet you and let you know I was going to be a part of this city and if I can ever do anything for your business, let me know. I walked into the Western Auto in Hamilton back in those days. And the owner there was a guy named Watha. Watha's wife was Geneva. I didn't know at the time. I walked in. I said, uh, I'm Dale Jenkins. I'm a new preacher at the Hamilton Church of Christ. He said, I'm Watha Williams. It's nice to have you in town. Very nice man. We visited for a while. Some people were ambivalent. When I'm in. He was nice. We visited for a while. At the end of the conversation, before I left, on my way out the door, I said, hey, I'd love for you to come worship with us sometime. You know what Watha said? Okay, I will. Sunday came. He didn't show up. The next Sunday came, it didn't show up. The next Sunday came, it didn't show up. I was looking for Watha to be there. So I went back to see him again. I walked in his door. You know what he said? Hey, preach. You know what that means. He didn't remember my name. I said, Watha, it's good to see you. He said, it's good to see you. How's business? He said, good. He said, how's business? I said, good. We visited a while. I had a real good visit. And at the end of the visit, I said, hey, we'd love for you to come to church with us sometime. You know what he said? I will. I thought gold star in my crown. I did good. I invited him to church. And I left. And he didn't show up. And it dawned on me. Something very important. So, Harley, when are we going to Big Springs Burgers? Now, there's only one answer to this question. No, nope, not that answer. <laughs> Only one answer is right on this. You don't know. I didn't invite you. I told you about it. I made it sound really good. But I didn't really invite you. Bob Carl, <clears throat> this is your moment to shine. This is your opportunity to fight. When are we going to Brooksy's barn? First chance, I No, 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 no. First, Monday in February at 4.30. <laughs> <laughs> You see, I gave them both good information. And one of the things I've learned about the family that I love, the Church of Christ, is we are excellent at information. We give it out all the time. We love telling people about our church. We love telling people about our scene. We love telling people, and there's a bell, and I'm assuming there's a second one. We love telling people... <laughs> It's a lecture, not an interview, Brother Bob. <laughs> we love telling people about our preacher. We love telling people about what we believe. We've got a track written on almost any subject you can name, right? But it dawned on me, I never invited Watha to church. I just gave him information. I gave you good information. But I didn't invite you. It sounded like I invited you. We ought to go sometime. But you didn't think when I said that there was really any invitation involved in it. You just thought it sounded nice. Yeah, it sounds good to me too. So I called Watha up and I said, Watha, we're having a gospel meeting. My friend Billy Smith is preaching. I'd love for you to come. We start uh, Sunday. How about if Monday night or Tuesday night, Melanie and I come over and pick you in Geneva up and Take you to River Chase Restaurant. I'll buy your supper and then we'll go to the meeting. You'll love Billy. You know what he said? 
He said, how dare you disturb me at my house? I'm a business... No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he said, that sounds nice. And so we did. He came Monday night. Then Tuesday night, he showed up on his own. And then the next Sunday, he came to church. He came Sunday night. He came Wednesday night. And for about three months, he never missed a service. He and Geneva never missed a service. I studied the gospel with him. Showed him the Joel Miller videos in those days. He went and baptized. A couple months later, I announced I was moving to Nashville to preach with the church there. On a Sunday night, about two or three months after I moved, I got a phone call from my friend Susan, and Susan said, Dale, I've got some good news for you. Wath and Geneva were baptized tonight. Every study that I have seen, 97, 96, 85, 79, 99, percent of the people who become Christians say the first time they were brought to or invited to church was by a friend or by a family member. What I want to challenge you to do today, and here's the sentence, is to move from information to invitation. Because it's a long way from information to invitation. A really long way. And a lot of people never make that trip. They give a lot of good information. But all I want to challenge you to do is to invite someone this week. In fact, if you don't mind, I'd like to challenge you to invite three people this week. To call them up and say, hey, we've got a meeting going on. Would you come either Monday or Tuesday night? Start at 6.30. After the service, we'll go get a glass of sweet tea. Or, uh, some ice cream somewhere. It's this weird guy preaching. I think you'll like him. And move from invitation, information to invitation. And maybe you'll get to experience that wonderful, unbelievable, out-of-the-park, over-the-top feeling at some point when that person, after being baptized into Christ, stands in front of these people and says, Listen, I'm thankful today to my God who forgave me of my sins. And I'm thankful for Bill or Sue or Bob or Sally because they invited me to hear the gospel. And you don't do it for that reason. But Paul will say in 2 Thessalonians, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you at the Lord's appearing? He's saying at the Lord's appearing. When the Lord comes, it will be those people that we've led to Him that will be our hope and our joy. Move from information to invitation. I know what I'm going to preach every sermon here. Unless... Unless. This can be an average meeting. For three or four days now, we've said, oh, it's been some nice time together. We got to know each other and come back sometime. That'll be all nice. Or tonight or tomorrow night. There can be three or four or five people in this audience who have not heard the gospel before. And one of your elders can come to me and say, listen, we've got several here tonight that aren't Christians. The church needs to be encouraged, but tonight, would you please preach a sermon that kindly is directed to individuals who aren't Christians because we need for them to hear that gospel. And that's what I'll do. I'll preach a sermon called Mr. Stranger. Or a sermon called, Do You Believe With All Your Heart Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Or a sermon called, Place at His Table. There'll be sermons that will be faith building and we'll introduce them to the church in what I hope is a positive manner. But the key is not me. You'll have better preachers and you'll have worse preachers. They'll come here and hold meetings. The key is in your hands to move from information to invitation. Thank you for listening.
Good morning, everyone. Willie kindly volunteered to let me take his place as doing announcements. Thank you, brother. <laughs> um, we'll mention those on our prayer list. Make sure you always remember Steve and Judy Bryan and the McCathys. And we have also Scott. Um, he... Uh, went into the ER this morning, so always keep him in your prayers with his different struggles. Betty Smith, Karen Shepard, Arthur Anderson, Dakota Riley, Rachel Palmer, 
Carrie Ng, and good to see you. Don and Barb McAfee and Virginia Blevin. Uh, I was just told a minute ago that Barbara is actually having one of her lymph nodes removed this week to try to figure out what's going on. She's in a lot of pain, so let's make sure we're praying for her. Um, a few reminders about what was discussed last week. The elders presented to us challenges for us to get more active and get to doing things. And so they asked us to help with the Thanksgiving meal, which has happened annually, but uh, it's part of the activity we're starting. And so there's sign-up sheets at the back, and then there's fruit baskets that are going to be in December, feeding the hungry on the third Wednesday. So that is one week from this Wednesday. So uh, that'll be the first for that, and we're excited. But it's also going to be work, so we need you all here on that Wednesday night at 5 p.m. Um, also, uh, in the text message chain and now in the bulletin, we're going to be doing scripture writing this month, so make sure you're writing down your verses. And if you think it's a little bit of work to write the verses out, it is. Uh, William's been writing his out. We all write ours out, and it takes him a while. He works hard at it. You can too. But it's good for us. It's good for us. Remember what we're thankful for to God. All right, this morning in our Bible class, we were challenged to go from information to invitation. And the challenge ended with that each of us need to invite three people to the gospel meeting. I'm already picturing at least one I'm going to invite. I bet you are too. Invite three people to the gospel meeting this week. And if you do, he might change the sermons. So there's your uh, motivation. Information to invitation and motivation. All right. Our uh, order of worship today, first of all, our opening prayer will be Jason Byron. To take charge of the Lord's Supper will be Matt Keem. Our scripture reading will be Willie Ng. Our preacher will be Del Jenkins. And before he gets up to speak, I will do a short introduction. Closing prayer will be Kendall and song leader will be Dennis. And our scripture will be Romans chapter 12. We'll look there in a moment. As we enter into our worship this morning, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne, giving you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Thanking you for your Son the life he lived, the life he gave, and his resurrection. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity and privilege to be here this morning to offer our worship to you. May we do so in a manner that will be pleasing to you, that we will participate in spirit and in truth, that your name be glorified, and magnified, and that we will be encouraged and uplifted through Christ we pray. Amen. If it's convenient for you, please stand. <coughs> holy, holy, holy. Thank you. 
Would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day, for this beautiful Lord's day, as we humbly approach your throne. Lord, we're thankful for the time of year that it is, the changing of the seasons, the beauty that's ever present out, out there in, in your creation. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to come and worship you this morning. Thank Brother Jenkins being here to hold this gospel meeting, and I pray that much good will, will come from it. Lord, we're thankful for this congregation that meets here in Miami and work that she does. Pray that you'll continue to bless it. Lord, the prayer list is, is very large this morning. I don't know the names of everyone that was mentioned. I pray that you'll be with each, each and every one of them and the special need that they have and that you'll bless them and that your will be done in each individual case. Lord, we're thankful for the eldership here. Thankful for the, the news that was mentioned a moment ago from the pulpit about the, the, um, the work that they're doing and um, just be with them. Pray that the congregation here in Miami will continue to grow. Lord, I pray that you'll be with us as we partake of the Lord's Supper here in a few minutes, and I pray that we will truly focus on the, the meaning behind that and the sacrifice that was made by Jesus Christ. We're thankful that we have the hope of eternal salvation through Him. And I pray, Lord, that we'll do everything that we can to bring others to you, bring as many people to heaven as we possibly can. Lord, we're thankful for our employment, the means that we have to earn money, to run our households. I pray, Lord, that we'll always be people that will give cheerfully and abundantly so the work in our, our individual congregations can continue to move forward. Lord, we're thankful for the health that we have to be here today. Lord, I pray that you'll forgive us when we fall short. We we'll pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Be
First off, before we begin, does everyone have a, a cup for communion? If not, just raise your hand and someone will be able to get you one. Looks like we're good. This week, as I was trying to prepare, you know, Arthur's always good about giving us some heads up if we're going to uh, head this part up. And this is always something that probably stresses me out a little more than others, uh, gets me a little more nervous speaking. So I was reading through several commentaries as to how I kind of wanted to go with this and ran across a lesson that Nathan Adams had put together uh, quite a while ago. And uh, to be quite honest, I think he says it just about as well as you can. And so there's a couple of points of his that I'm going to bring up to help us focus our minds before we take part in the Lord's Supper. 
he had a, a lesson here and he hit on the great memorial of our Lord. And the two aspects that I want to fo focus on that he hit on were to never forget and the ability within ourselves to say never again. You know, there have been many times in, in history, there have been heinous acts that have been perpetrated on one nation or another. And we think about our own nation and actions that have been taken against it. And we have had rally cries that come up, you know, remember the Alamo Harbor that rallied our nation at various times to uh, basically overcome those who sought to harm us. And then most recently, we think of 9-11. And here it is some 20 years removed from that event. And yet we know it's easy to forget without a memorial, without emblems and to look upon and remember. You know, as time goes on in our lives, <clears throat> it's kind of a defense mechanism in our minds. We don't hold on to those things that are sad or difficult to remember for very long. It's easier for our minds to move to the day to day, to fill up our minds with our normal activities, the things that we uh, deal with day in, day out, and it floods our mind, right? It crowds out those things in history, those things of importance that we need to remember, those things that aren't actually just right in front of us at all times. We resolutely state that, uh, let me back up, excuse me. These events in this life, there are events in this life that we shouldn't forget though. And at the top of this list, of course, is the death of our Lord and our Savior. We resolutely state that we will never forget because we must live our lives every day being driven by what took place on that hill far away. The events of this longest day are the whole of who we are as sinners who desperately need salvation. Such salvation only comes through sacrificial death in which an unblemished body is broken and pure blood is shed. Jesus Christ is the only person who could have ever filled that role. So based on this fact, we should never forget. It's a moment of memorial that gives us a, a cause to be humbled, right? This reminder that God has given us, right? A frequency with which we need weekly. And he's designed it that way, that we will reflect upon our Savior and his sacrifice for us, and it puts us in our needed place. The reminder that we who are unworthy have life because the one who was worthy died. It does move us to a point where within this moment of remembrance, we have the motivation to say never again. President Ronald Reagan said in a memorial ceremony at Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in Germany, and this is what his quote, everywhere here are memories, pulling us, touching us, making us understand that they can never be erased. Such memories take us where God intended his children to go, toward learning, toward healing, and above all, toward redemption. They beckon us through the endless stretches of our heart to the knowing commitment that the life of each individual can change the world and make it better. We're all witnesses. We share the glistening hope that rests in every human soul. Hope leads us if we're prepared to trust it toward what our President Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. And then rising above all this cruelty out of this tragic and nightmarish time, Beyond the anguish, the pain, the suffering for all time, we can and must pledge never again. While President Reagan was talking about the Jewish Holocaust here during World War II, there is so much that could apply to the memorial of our Lord. When we partake of the memorial supper, there are memories everywhere within ourselves that God's word brings to the forefront of our mind. These memories take us where God wants us to go toward a life of commitment to him. It provides hope to each of us and drives us to be better. Rising out of the great cruelty, 
The anguish, the pain, the suffering, the tragedy of our Lord's death is a pledge never again. We are dedicated to never again allow our lives to fall into the sinful and lost condition that Christ came and died to save us from. His suffering and death will not be in vain in our lives. Our King Jesus blessed us with this memorial service that we would never forget his sacrifice and thereby the love would motivate us to never again live for sin. If you'd bow with me. Our almighty, heavenly, holy, and awesome Father, Lord, we are so very humbled in this moment that we have this opportunity, this privilege to surround this table, gathered together, united in heart and mind and desire, Lord, to remember our Savior. Lord, it is only by your precious and holy Son that each one of us has hope. It is only because of his willingness to fulfill your eternal plan to save us all, Lord, that we now have this joy within our hearts. Lord, it's because of Jesus, his perfection in this life, his willingness, Lord, to be perfect upon this earth, walking in the flesh. And then, Lord, his willingness to endure so much pain, so much agony and suffering at the hands of unjust men that we now have hope for eternity with you. Lord, help us in this moment as we break of this bread that we remember what it symbolizes. It's an emblem to remember Jesus' body that was beaten, that was mocked, that was shamed, that was crucified upon that cross so that we could be saved. Our sins hung upon him. Lord, we beg you for forgiveness and mercy. And we beg you, Lord, that you strengthen us, that we live lives according to that example. Lord, we love you so much. We're so thankful for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Father, as we continue to pray and as we continue to remember Jesus and the pain and suffering he endured, Lord, it's only because of his precious and holy blood that we are now cleansed. It's by his righteousness clothing us, Lord, that we can be redeemed to you. And it's because Jesus gave all. His holy and precious blood gives us life. And we are so eternally thankful for that. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen each one of us, that you would help us, Lord, to take of this fruit of the vine in such a way that brings him honor and glory, that helps us to rededicate our own lives, seeking to live for you, to honor you, Lord, through the example we have in Jesus. Lord, we love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we have just concluded our memorial to the Lord, we'll take a little bit of time to reflect on how the Lord gives so much to us. At the end of each pew here, or excuse me, at the end of each aisle, we do have some collection plates laid out if anyone would like to give. Uh, and I will pray for that offering at this time. Our almighty, heavenly, and holy Father, as we have just spent time reflecting upon the most gracious gift of all the universe, Lord, and that is Jesus Lord, we are so thankful for the example you show us and how, how much you give, Lord, your generosity, your love, your compassion for each one of us. Lord, help us to be motivated by that great example to want to give. Lord, you bless so much in our lives. Our cup truly does runneth over. And we just pray, Lord, with 
the bountiful ways in which you love us and provide for us, Lord, we will want to show generosity to others. Help us, Lord, to, to want to give without compulsion, but a desire, Lord, just to please you and to help others around us. Lord, we do pray for this offering, that how it's used, Lord, is in accordance with your will, that it will be used to strengthen the church, the kingdom, and Lord, to edify those that need it, Lord, and to to just to glorify your holy and precious name. Lord, we love you so much. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Again, it's convenient for you. Please stand. <clears throat> This will be the song before our scripture reading and introduction in our lesson. Love one another. <laughs> Oh, 
The scripture reading this morning will be taken from uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. To me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Well, I want to start the same way I started Bible class saying thank you. Thank you, Trevor, for finding and booking him, and uh, thank you for all your work, and uh, thank you, elders. It's been about a half a dozen years since the last time I had a gospel meeting at my local church, so this is pretty exciting. In China, uh, from China, we had a missionary one time come and speak, and that was great, but this is great to have a gospel meeting. Uh, Brother Dell Jenkins, I'm going to give the last introduction all week, and after this, it's going to get shorter and shorter. Dell Jenkins was born in Hamilton, Alabama, and he's married to Melanie. This was from 2019, so he's going to correct everything that's wrong. He has two sons and five grandchildren. Is that still right? Sounds two right. and five. All right. Dell is the minister at Spring Meadows Church of Christ in Spring Hill, Tennessee. The church there began meeting with only 40 people and has grown to over 500 in attendance. Dell has authored and or co-authored over 50 books and authored hundreds of published articles. Dell, along with his brother Jeff, founded and run the Jenkins Institute, which serves, encourages, and equips ministers. Dell Jenkins. Thank you, Zane. And thank you. It's been a joy to worship with you today, to sing and to pray together and to commune with the Lord and to think about uh, His sacrifice for us. I know of nowhere on earth I'd rather be than with God's people worshiping God. What a blessing it is. So, we got to ask a question, an important question. You're interested, I believe, many of you are, in the church growing. You'd like to see the church grow. And so we're going to ask you a question. How do you grow a church? Well, the Associated Press did a, a study a number of years ago. And in this study, they looked at 39 different religious groups. And they asked in this study why the clicker didn't work. <clears throat> and they didn't find out anything at all. There it is. Okay. So they looked at 39 different religious bodies. And they asked the question, why is it that some churches grow while other churches kind of flounder? Why is it some churches flourish while other churches die? Why do some churches do really remarkably well while other churches don't grow? And they looked at them regardless of their denomination, regardless of the location, regardless of the age of the members, regardless of any of those externals like, like the structure of how they were put up or, or where they were located. Why is it that some churches grow while other churches don't do quite as well? And they developed what they called a love quotient. And they found out and they started looking at what are some of the keys to church growth? Why do some churches grow while other churches don't? And so in this love quotient, they said they in 1 to 100 of the 12 that scored below 65, they were all churches that were not growing. And of the 13 that scored above 65, they were all churches that were growing. And they said, we can conclude that there is a reason why churches grow. Now remember, they were not looking at it from a spiritual standpoint. But what they concluded was, churches grow when there is an atmosphere of love among the members toward each other and toward those that are outside. Well, they didn't tell us anything that we didn't already know. They didn't tell us anything new. Jesus, in fact, said it a long time ago. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one to another. You love each other. You see, the fact is, and there's no doubt about it, that when churches really begin to love each other, the way that God wants us to love each other, 
the world would be one. I don't know if the statement is true or not, that we'd have to lock the doors to keep people out from coming inside if, if we really loved each other like we should and loved those outside like we should. But there's no doubt our churches would do much better if we would practice that kind of love. You see, the fact is, people are looking for love. They're looking for it. Everybody on this earth looking for someone to love them. The most vile, evil person you find on this earth, they want somebody to love them. So the question is, how do I love? Well, if you've got your Bibles this morning, I invite you to open the book of Romans. Romans is such a neat book. Casey Mosier wrote a book a number of years ago called uh, The Gist of Romans, and he said, if you get Romans, God gets you. If you get Romans, God gets you. What a, what a great quote. Well, I don't know about you, but I want God to get me, so I want to get Romans. So Rick click let's kind of outline the book. It really, it's amazing how preachers can outline anything in three points, but there are three sections of the book of Romans. The first section is chapters 1 through 3 that talks about sin and separation. And then chapter 4 and verse 6, he'll talk about salvation and sanctification. And then the final section, chapter 12, verse 7 through chapter, through chapter 16, through the end of the book, he'll talk about service. I'd invite you to notice on the screen that, that uh, a realization of sin always comes before salvation. I invite you to understand that the person cannot become a great servant until they understand sanctification. Those things go hand in hand. One does not come before the other in our lives. Let's put a little bit of meat on the outline. If you've got your Bible, in Romans chapter 1, let's start in chapter 1. We're going to chapter 12. But let's, look, let's run through Romans real quick. Paul really concludes with this introduction, or he, he, he uh, introduces with this conclusion. Look at chapter 1, verse 16, where he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For therein, he says, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then he introduces us to two groups of people. The, the ungodly and the unrighteous, or as one guy called them, the wicked, wicked, wicked. He first talks about the ungodly, and it may shock you who these two groups are. The ungodly were the Gentile world, the pagans, and sometimes people ask me as a preacher, why is it that what did God do with people who are not Jews before Jesus came? Well, what I believe is you have people like Nathan and Melchizedek and and uh, other individuals in the Old Testament, I believe they were still under the patriarchal age where God spoke to the, the head of the household. God had a way of salvation for them just like He has always had a way of salvation for every person. But He talks about the wicked people. He says they should have known about God. They should have known about Him, but they did not. And instead they began to worship and serve the creature, look at the text, instead of the Creator. They became the first humanist. They weren't thankful, and their lack of thankfulness led them to begin to worship man more than God. And that's the whole concept of humanism. You want to know one of the reasons our world is in such a mess today? Here it is. Humanism doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because ultimately, humanism says a human is all that really matters, and if I'm a human, then I'm all that really matters, and why are your rights more important than my rights? Christianity says, love God first, love each other second. We miss that sometimes in our studies. So, they became the first humanist. And then it says, they began to, to change that which was natural to the unnatural. As one preacher friend of mine says, the rest of Romans chapter 1 reads like the front page of any large city newspaper in America. As they go from one sin to another. But be careful lest you excuse yourself because in the last couple of verses you'll say not only are those who practice such things, homosexuality and worshiping man instead of God and all those ideas that have become so prevalent in our culture, not only are those who practice those things guilty, but also those who approve of them. My Christian friend, we cannot sit in our cubicles and watch the world go to hell in a handbasket. We can't sit by and act like we don't care that this world is lost. A lost soul is a tragedy to God and it should be to every Christian. But then he turns his attention to the wicked wicked. And this is where it's kind of shocking. The wicked wicked is the 
the unrighteous. They should have known about God, but they did not. It's the Jewish people in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, the first five verses, he'll say, you've despised the goodness of God. It was meant to cause you to praise God and glorify God, God, but instead you're practicing the very things that you're condemning and you're using God as cover. In other words, you're living the way you want to live your life and you're showing up to them on the synagogue, to us, to church, on Sunday and acting like you're a Christian when you're really not God's person at all. Look at what he says. You therefore, O man, are without excuse. You know, every time I read Romans chapter 1, I I picture some self-righteous Jewish person kind of sitting down and saying, now Paul, you get those those Jewish people told. You preach those Jewish people. What would it be if it ended in Romans chapter 3? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody's a sinner. But in chapter 4, a little light begins to shine. It's introduced to a a concept. The man is Abraham. The concept is belief. And three times the text will say, Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. And then you get to chapter 5. And that light turns into a beacon. As we're introduced to three words in the first verse. The word grace. The word peace. And the word Christ. Three words go together. Peace and grace only come through Jesus Christ. And he'll spend chapter 5 talking about God's marvelous grace and what it's done in our life. How powerful that is. How it's changed our life. How it's brought joy in our life. In fact, he talks so much about God's grace in chapter 5. Chapter 6, you might conclude, maybe I should just sin more. Because if my sin highlights God's grace, if I sin more, God's grace is highlighted more. That's the very question, Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say to this? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You know the worst. God forbid. How shall we that have died to sin and live any longer therein? Or do you not know? And watch it here. In a book about theology and sanctification and grace, and he, he breaks into a song about baptism. It's not a book about baptism, but a look hand in hand with the grace of God in your New Testament, you will find baptism. Do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ? Not only should we not live a life of sin, you skip down to about verse 23, I believe it is, we shouldn't even be guilty of living one, of holding one sin in our life, like some kind of pet that we bring out every now and then. When I was a child, I didn't really understand Romans chapter 7. And it was such a complicated book. <laughs> There's this tongue twister section in there where Paul will say, the good I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I don't want to do, I do. I don't understand as a child, but I live it every day as an adult. I wake up with every plan and intention of doing something good. When the day's over, I find I've not done all I planned on doing. I have a life of sin, but I find myself stumbling and falling. In fact, look at Paul's conclusion. Oh, wretched man, he says in chapter 7 at the end of it. Oh, wretched man that I am. Or guy, one guy say Paul was talking about his life before he was a Christian. You go back to the Greek. The tense of that word is present tense. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall save me from this body of death? And then we get to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 may be the greatest chapter in all the Bible. It begins with no separation and ends with no con- or it begins with no condemnation, ends with no separation. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. There is no condemnation of them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And then he closes it by saying, And what shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus? Height or death, demons, angels, things present, things to come, your past. What what will separate? Nothing can separate us from that marvelous love of Jesus Christ. For the sake of time, we'll run real quick through Romans 9, 10, and 11. Paul really begins to turn his attention to the people that lived in his neighborhood. We call them my, my, my countrymen, my neighbors, the Jewish people. And oh, if we had a heart for lost people like Paul did, there'd be a whole lot less lost people in this world. Look at what he says. I would wish myself a castaway if it would mean the lost sheep of the house of Israel could be saved. I bear the record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Oh, how Paul wanted to see those people saved. 
I wish we had that same kind of heart. He's still talking about salvation when you get to uh, chapter 12, verse 1. The verse has all been read to us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The word sacrifice there is the word latreo. It's the drink offering the Old Testament. That you pour your life out as an act of worship before God. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed with the renew of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's still talking about our salvation. But finally, when we get to chapter 12 and verse 9, he begins to shift gears. And he talks to, in all likelihood, the majority of the people that are in this room today. As he begins to talk about how we should serve, how we should love, so how do we grow a loving church? I have uh, seven points today. And please forgive me, I need to apologize. That was the introduction. We won't spend as long on the seven points as an introduction for those of you who are timekeepers like I am. But I do think this is worth our consideration. If we're going to grow a loving church, Paul gets very, very practical. And look what he says in verse 9. Your love must be sincere. That word sincere is a neat word. In first century culture, a Greek, a Greek sculptor might come along and be working on a piece of art, a, a bust of marble or of granite, and he's chipping away at it and maybe he puts a groove in the face where it shouldn't be, or you know, like Mike Tyson bites off or chips off a piece of the ear. A dishonest artisan would go back and he would take wax and he would fill in that groove or replace that little part he clipped off on the ear with wax. A wise art buyer would take a piece of art and before he bought it, he would set it in the center of the city in the daylight under the sun and the sun would melt away the wax. And if no wax melted away, that piece of art was said to be sincere. Look at what he says. One translation says, your love must be without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. That literally means, I'm, I'll get there in a second. <laughs> this, this concept of hypocrisy, you've heard it before. We, it's thrown at us every, every now and then. You know, you're a hypocrite or this person's a hypocrite. It, it's, the, it's a concept of literally of wearing a mask. Hypocrisy without a mask. And so in the first century, these these theater groups would travel around and they may only have two or three roles or two or three members of the, the theater troupe, but there may be seven or eight roles in the play. And so a person would come out and they play a role and then they go backstage and they, they put on a different toga and they come out and they have a mask over their face and they wear play a completely different role. He says, in growing churches, in loving churches, your love must be without a mask. In other words, you must be authentic. That's the word our kids would like to use today. You must be authentic in what you are. Every once in a while I hear somebody say, I don't really like them, but I love them in the Lord. I know what they're really saying is, that's not what they're I always think, isn't that special? <laughs> what they're really saying is, I can't stand their guts. If you can divorce some way you're human emotions from your spiritual emotions. We've got to learn in churches to really love each other. I, no one's called me. No one's told me. But I'm guessing if you're like most churches, there are some people in this building that you will stand up and you'll talk about how we love each other. But there's some people in this building because of some matter or some issue that's come along, you, you, you butt heads and you're like all in vinegar and you just, you're at each other's to the point that you don't even speak anymore. Love must be sincere. So we come to church, you know, coats and ties, heels and hose. How's it going? Everything's wonderful, brother. Everything's great. How's it going, sister? All things are good. I'm fine. We argue like cats and dogs on the way to the church building, you know. Or, or we don't know how we're going to pay the bills next week. Our lives feel like they're spiraling dramatically out of control. How do we grow a loving church? Well, number one, we are sincere. We're sincere. Love means you've got to take a stand. Look at the rest of the text. 
hate that which is evil, cling to what is good, or abhor that which is evil, literally to draw away from what is evil in our lives. You know why we're to, to hate things? The Bible tells us six things the Lord hates, actually seven in Proverbs chapter 6. Why does God hate things? Why do we hate things? Because the fact exists that uh, evil hurts people. God doesn't hate people. He hates these things. Because that evil in this lives hurt people. He says, cling to what is good. Literally, be wedded to what is good. Be so engaged in good that you don't have any time at all to be involved in what is evil. Or as old adage say, we've got to learn to love the sinner and hate the sin. But sometimes we get that in some convoluted way, reversed in our minds and our lives, and we end up hating the sinner and loving the the sin, laughing at the sin on television, but when they see the sinner on the side of the road begging for something, we start questioning motives and everything else, and hate wells up inside of us. Number two, if we're going to grow a loving church, we've got to be careful of each other's needs. Look what he says in verse 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Be devoted to one another in love. It's a play on words here. You, you know this already. Zane's told you. Nathan probably told you before, and 75 other preachers told you before. They told you there are four Greek words. I know it's long. It won't last too long. There are four Greek words for the word love. There's a the word phleo, which is brotherly love. There's a the word agape, which is a godly kind of love. There's eros, which is the kind of love we see played out most in our culture, but is the kind that is not in the Bible. It's not mentioned in the Bible. That word is not. There's a the word storge which is a word for a family kind of feeling. This word here in Romans chapter 12 is the only time that this word is used in the Bible. It's phileo storges. storgos. It, it literally means a family kind of love. Now you know what today is, don't you? It's November the 7th. Can you believe we're already in November? We're like, what, three weeks away from Thanksgiving. Today is my wife's birthday. So... Miami. Miami. I'm in Oklahoma. <laughs> I knew I'd do that at some point. <laughs> I spent our 25th wedding anniversary in Paris, France. I, uh, on our 50th, I'm going to take Melanie with me, I guess. But it's, a, it's a true statement, but it's a city of love, you know. So, family, families, it's Thanksgiving, and families are going to get together, aren't you? I mean, they're going to spend some time together. And, and you've all got them in your Kids will do what our kids did and what I did when I was a kid and what your grandkids do. You're going somewhere for that meal together with family. And your little four or five year old, six year old boy says, Aunt Ree's not going to be there, is she? And you already know Aunt Ree's going to be there. Woman that walks, runs up to you and grabs you and puts you in a death grip hug and gives you a big, fat, wet, slobbery kiss on the cheek. Uncle Melvin's not going to be there, is he? He smokes a cigar and he smells a little funny and he tells some jokes that you don't quite understand and uses some words that you really don't use and you're not exactly sure how to take his little pranks he pulls. Now what do you do as a parent? You say, of course they're going to be there. And you've got to love them. Because, right? You can finish it, can't you? They're family. Right? And, and I always tell people, if you don't understand that, you probably are Aunt Rhea or Uncle Melvin, okay? Just so you're aware of this. What is this kind of love? What is this phileo storge kind of love? It's the ability to live together close with mutual respect. You don't know me well enough to fully decipher this sentence but I'm compelled to say it because it's what the Scripture here teaches. It does not mean you line up on every idea that comes along. It doesn't mean you agree with each other on every position that's come down the pike. It doesn't mean you see every issue eye to eye. It means you have love for each other regardless. You have mutual respect for each other anyway. You have that kind of love that is special only to Christians and to Christians all the time. Look what he says in the text. 
Honor one another above yourselves. Literally, he's saying you're to be involved in a competition to outdo each other in honoring each other. Not in who can one up the another on the story you tell, but who can show honor towards someone else. Who's in charge of honoring in this church? You know who it is? The one another there is a neat word. We may notice it again in a couple of minutes. Um, the word, the Greek word is the word alelu. alelu. Now, Zane, that's not actually the Greek word, but it's very similar to it. And it sounds Hawaiian when I say it that way, and I remember it that way, so that's how I say it, okay? Y'all can pronounce it your own way, but none of you speak Greek, so you're all right. But alelu, it's the idea of that which is reflective. In other words, what I'm doing is being reflected. It's being done back to me. But it's also reciprocal, which means not only is it being done back to me, but everybody in the room is doing it to each other. So when you talk about each other, you ought to know things about each other that says, hey, I honor this person because of this in their life that they've overcome, or because of this in their life that they're doing, or because of this in their life that they've done, or because of this thing in their life that they're trying to accomplish for the Lord. We ought to have on the tips of our tongues things we can tell about every Christian, we've got to be willing to let other people get the credit. And as one preacher said, God can do great things through the person who doesn't care who gets the credit. Alelu, honor one another. Next point. Look at it. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Number five. Excuse me, number three. All right, <laughs> we got to move. Be contagious with enthusiasm. That word enthusiasm is a neat word. It, it has a concept. It's, it's from a Latin word, in theos, or in God. Every once in a while I'm speaking to somebody, I'll say, I want you to come, I want you to share some of your enthusiasm. We misunderstand the word. Some of our brotherhood began to think that the word means we pump something new into our assembly, something artificial that builds us up and pumps us up. Literally, the idea is being in God. Isn't it amazing how some Christians can kind of just slack, slack in and slack out like an old hound dog? No enthusiasm about anything at all. I'll be enthusiastic when it comes to our servants of the Lord. Not lacking in zeal, he says here. So the preacher gets on the line and begs us. We're having a gospel meeting. We all please invite somebody. And maybe you feel guilty and you finally call somebody up and you say something like this. Hi, this is Jim. You wouldn't want to come to church with me tonight, would you? No enthusiasm at all. We've got the greatest message in the world. And we've got the one thing that can change someone's existence more than anything else. The gospel of Jesus Christ. We ought to be on fire with that concept, with that idea. We ought to be more excited than we can ever express. Never lacking in zeal, he says. Of course, Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. I know your works, he says, the church will lay out of sea. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. But because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. The text, literally, the idea there is that a lukewarm Christian Makes God sick to his stomach. I don't want to be lukewarm in my faith. How do you get that kind of enthusiasm? Well, you fill your life with love. The most unloving people I've ever met in the world are the people that are most unenthusiastic. The most enthusiastic people, I'm the most loving people I know in the world are those people who are enthused. They're quick and ready to respond. They're involved in every good thing in the church. The church that has a lot of love is an enthusiastic church without a lot of apathy, a lot of people that just don't care. So, look at the text. Serving the Lord. I had not been preaching very long. When I moved to Hamilton, Alabama, I mentioned earlier in the Bible class, and as a preacher, I thought you had to start every sermon with a joke. And I lived in the great state of Alabama. And so I started every sermon with an Alabama-Auburn joke. That's kind of like a Texas-Oklahoma joke, okay? And because I'm an Alabama fan, 
Alabama always won in these jokes, you know. You know, things like uh, two Auburn guys riding down the road in their pickup truck, and the guy driving says, to get the pasture, is my blinker light working? And the other guy looks out the window, and he cocks his head around and says, now it is, now it isn't, now it is. Now it I'm glad you got that. So many people don't. I preach in Alabama a lot, and a lot of those people are Auburn fans. So after about four or five weeks, one of the elders by the gym called me and said, Dale, he said, we need to go see Lee. Lee's going to stop coming to church. He's going somewhere else. He's going to leave the Lord. I said, why? What in the world? He said, well, Lee's an Auburn fan. I said, I didn't know that. He said, I didn't like it. He said, we need to give Lee something to do. We get him involved, he'll stay. I wish I'd been more mature then. What I should have said to him is, no, Brother Jim. You're going to fall in love with Jesus. He'll stay. Wild horses can't keep someone away. You can stone them. You can put them in prison. You can make them go without food or drink. You can threaten to skin them alive. You can put them up on stakes as lanterns for the king. And they're going to keep faithful to the Lord because they're enthused, because they're in God. The answer is it give somebody. You want your children to be faithful to the Lord? It's great to get them involved in service, and you ought to. But that's not the secret. The secret is you be so in love with the Lord, and you help them learn to love the Lord. Serving the Lord. I don't know who it is here in this good church, and I don't know what in the world is going on with that screen. Would you please move forward a little bit? One more will be good. Here's a great commentary on our verse today in Romans 12. Whatever you do, do it heartily, do it with all your heart, as working for the Lord and not into man. Somebody went to that lady that the world calls Mother Teresa, and they asked her, how do you keep your joy in Calcutta with all the death and the disease, the desperation in that country? Her answer was classic and one that I believe every Christian ought to hear. She said, we do our work for the Lord, and we do our work to the Lord, and we do our work with the Lord. And when we get that right in our lives, nothing will keep us from serving the Lord. I don't know who it is here that teaches the children's classes. Bless your heart. They came to you and said, uh, would you teach for a quarter? And you said yes, and they locked the door and took the key and threw it away. And 20 years later, you're still teaching might be like my friend Doug Burleson who said, I used to teach fifth grade boys and I thought at some point they're going to hoist them up their shoulders and carry me around like a winner of a Super Bowl coach. And he said, but no, that's not going to happen. I don't know who it is. It's the elders here yet. I've met a couple of them. Man, it's been a hard year for elders. They prayed and they tried to make wise decisions, but it doesn't matter what decision you've made the last year and a year and a half or so, it's been the wrong one for some people. They've been patient and they've tried to get people back and they don't know how to say it, how much to say it, how little to say. They pray about it and they work on it and they try to make some announcement they think is best for the church and then half the people are mad at it. What a rough role. I don't know who it is involved in benevolence here. But oh, what a chore. I worked with a church one time that we helped this lady nine times one summer. One even a member of our church. Nine times, the tenth time. She came in and asked for some help, and the elders and said, we just couldn't help her anymore. So the secretary said, secretary said, ma'am, I'm sorry, we just can't help you anymore. She cursed us out and said, I'll never be back in this place. They're passing through town, and they say, we're just passing through. We'll send the money back. We ran out of money. We'll send the money back if you'll help us with some gas. will never see that money again. Whether you're a teacher or a Bible class teacher or an elder or a benevolent person or some other servant role in this church, if you do it thinking people will appreciate it, you will not do it very long. But if you'll do it with the mentality of, Lord, I'm really doing this for you, you can do it as long as you need to. Very fast, already. Look at the 12. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be constant in prayer. Now, I've got bad news for you. I can't count well. This
points, but we'll move through them quickly. He says, be positive, be patient, and be prayerful. If you want to grow a loving church, you've got to have those three elements. He says first, be joyful in hope. There's plenty of bad news in this world. And I'll tell you something, I don't need more bad news. Do you? <laughs> I don't need more bad news in my life. Well, folks, we need to get it right sometimes in the church. We go around giving bad news to everybody. We're proprietors of good news. We preach the gospel. There's bad news involved in it, but if it ends with bad news, we're in bad shape. It's good news that we preach. This world's got enough bad news in it. People are hungry for some joy in their life. You know why Christians can be positive? This is not a, a Pollyanna positivity. Remember the 1950s, 1930s novel, but it came a 1950 book about a little girl that was orphaned and ended up moving to this town, and she was just happy all the time. She was just happy because she wanted to be happy. But our positivity is not Pollyanna. It's based upon something. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, if you'll flip back here in Romans 12, flip back a page in your Bible, you'll get to Romans 8, and he gives us seven reasons why Christians ought to be the most positive people in all the world. Let's look through them quickly. He says, number one, there's no condemnation on them that are in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to be condemned. No guilt in my life because I'm in Christ. Number two, he says, through Christ, the law of the Spirit set me free from the law of sin and death. I'm not going to die. Sometime I'm going to transfer and be with God forever. Number three, he says, in this same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. How often do we not know what to pray about a situation? God helps us to pray even when we don't know what to pray. Number four, uh, we know that all these things work for the good of those who love Him but are called according to His purpose. That is one of the most misused verses in the Bible. That verse does not say that everything that happens in the life of a Christian is good. It doesn't give you license to stand in a casket and say, oh, this is really a good thing. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying God can take the bad in our life and use it for good. Number five, he says, what shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Or as old preacher used to say, God plus one always equals a majority. Number six is kind of a tongue twister. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also alone with him graciously give us all things? In other words, if God loved you enough to send Christ to take care of the biggest problem in your life, don't you think he can take care of the other things that are small in comparison? And number seven, the verse where I looked at, Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's why Christians can be positive. It's a concrete thing. He says, number two, be patient in affliction. Turn back one more page in your Bible to Romans chapter 5. And watch the text here as he says in verse 3. Not only so, but we also rejoice in tribulation because we know that tribulation, uh, suffering, produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. We have hope in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that we can be confident that the plan of God and the power of God are greater than the problems of the present. Then third, he says, be faithful in prayer. Someone said prayer is like the giant release valve of the stresses of life. You under pressure this week? You got a project's due and you don't know what to do about it? You got problems going on in your life that you don't know how to handle? Start praying. It releases something in your life that is beautiful and that is life-changing. If you're having a hard time loving somebody, start praying for them. It's nearly impossible to hate someone and pray for them at the same time. It will change your life, and we believe it will change them. In fact, I sometimes wonder if Paul who wrote Romans is not a direct answer to prayer. Remember when we first meet Paul, his name was Saul? You remember what was going on? Stephen, who preached that God loves everybody, was being stoned because he preached that God loved everybody. That'll still get you in trouble today. He preached God loves everybody and he's being stoned. And you remember the text says they brought their cloaks or outer garments and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now why'd they do that? Well, Carl, I don't know why they do that. I've wondered. Did they do that because Saul was... As Galatians says, advanced above all his peers in the Jewish, Jewish religion, that he was kind of in charge of the whole affair. Or they do it because he was young and he didn't need to have his reputation sullied at that point by being a part of killing a person that was preaching uh, about Christ. I don't know which it was. But I do know that, saw, that Stephen prayed basically the same thing Christ prayed on the cross Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And the tense of it indicates that he prayed it over and over again. And sometimes I wonder if the great Apostle Paul was not the result somewhat of the prayer of people like Stephen. All right, number five. Want to grow a loving church? 
open your heart and your home to others. I heard about one church that decided to take this seriously. In fact, here's what the verse says. Share with the Lord's people are in need. And uh, he says, practice hospitality. I heard about one church decided to take this seriously. They started a ministry. They gave out to the audience, everybody in the audience, they gave them a three-by-five card. They said on one side of the card, we want to write down anything that you can do that you'd be willing to do for others. Somebody wrote down, I'm, I'm a nurse, I'd be happy to sit up with people. Somebody wrote down, I'm, I'm an accountant, I'd be happy to help people with, their, with advice on finance. So somebody else wrote down, I can cook for people. Somebody else wrote down, all sorts of things. They said, now flip the card over on the other side of the card, I want you to write down anything that you have you'd share with people. Wrote, and I've got some dishes I'd be happy to share. I'm not using. I'm, somebody wrote, I've got some furniture. Somebody said, I've got a little car I'm not using. Somebody, I've got a rotor tiller I'm not using. I'd be happy to be welcome. This church got so serious about it, they had to eventually hire what they called a full-time minister of health because they got so serious about this concept of helping each other. How hospitable are we as a church? How welcoming are we as a church? I was impressed this morning when I walked in the front door that there were Three beautiful young people, children that were there welcoming me to this building. And I walked in and several of you spoke to me. I wonder if you do that with every guest. And I pray that you do. Are we people who are open, we're hospitable to people? The text says, point number six, bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Number six, We'll get to it in a minute. Well, there's a question. Do Christians ever persecute Christians? There's a better way to ask this. Do brothers ever persecute brothers? When I was growing up, we used to love wrestling. Friday night wrestling from the Boutwell Auditorium in Birmingham, Alabama with Tom York, York and Steve were uh, emceeing it. Those wrestlers, Tojo Yomoto, Bearcat Brown, Andre the Giant, those guys were awesome. My favorite was Tojo Yomoto because anytime he was this little short Japanese guy, and anytime he really wasn't Japanese, actually, he was from New Zealand, I think. But anytime the ref would turn his head, Tojo would take those wooden clogs off and he'd beat the person with them. I was older than both my brothers, and I always envisioned myself as Tojo Yomoto. <laughs> it became kind of a self fulfilling prophecy, sadly. But so we come along, though, and Anytime my mom and dad would go out of town, they'd go out for the night to got to a gospel meeting where they weren't taking us or a visitation of a funeral or, or some other event where we, weren't, we were not going with them. No sooner would they close the door and they'd leave us by ourselves, no sooner would they close the door. Brother Kerry would look at me and he'd say, Dale, let's wrestle. And I'd say, Kerry, I don't want to wrestle you. You'll beat me up. And he'd say, Dale, if you won't wrestle me, I'll beat you up. Do brothers ever persecute brothers? Well, sometimes they do. Look at what he says here. Don't speak evil or negative of a brother or sister. The world will welcome them back. The corner bar will welcome them back. But when someone stumbles, are we ready to speak well instead of evil? Are we ready to restore such one, as Paul said in Galatians 6, in the spirit of meekness? I want to make you a guarantee. And that guarantee is clear and easy to understand. That we have the opportunity to speak well of other people. And when we do, it will bless our lives as well. Bless, speak well of. Who's involved here in the ministry of affirmation? I love the quote from George Washington Carver. I will never allow another man to make me hate him and so belittle my so, I can't control what other people say about me, but I can control what I say about you, and I can control how I respond, and that's what I will be held accountable to God for. Number six, be sympathetic toward each other's feelings. Be sympathetic toward each other's feelings. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. I'm not sure which is harder. You know, everybody weeps at the casket, you know. But what about... What do you do in your life when they get the pay raise and you get overlooked? When they get the promotion and you get downsized? What do you do when they have the grandchild and you get the grand dog? I mean, it's harder sometimes to re rejoice with those who rejoice than weep with those who weep. 
But he says as Christians, we need to be involved in both in our life. The only kind Christian word that some people hear will hear spoken all week will be the words that you speak to. Do we encourage each other in that way? Number seven, finally, avoid pride and partiality. He says we are in verse 16 to condescend to those who are low estate. My dad probably would not like me telling this story. He's been dead 11 years now. He preached at the Woodline Robot Parkway Church in Birmingham for 43 years. And for 43 years, that church averaged baptizing one person every seven days for 43 years. Sometimes we would ask how that happened. Well, growing up, it seemed like we docked doors every single Saturday and Sunday. Gospel meeting come up, we're out knocking doors. After gospel meeting, we're knocking doors. And I hated it because I was afraid of dogs. Still am. I had a dread fear of dogs. And in every house was a candidate to have a dog in it. So we'd have these little cards. We'd go up and invite people to study the Bible with us, uh, the John Hurt Bible Correspondence Course. Would you like to study the Bible? I'd take those cards. I'd put them in... You know, in fire grates, I'd put them under windows of cars, I'd put them in mailboxes. I know it's a federal offense, but I didn't know it. The statute of limitations run out. I'd do everything I could to get rid of those cars. God, I didn't want to see dogs. I remember that Saturday that Dad said, Dale, today you're going with me. He was making assignments. And I knew what that meant. We go to every door. We're in Tarrant City, kind of a rough section of Birmingham. We walked up to one house. The picket fence around it was broken down and in disrepair. Needed painting. The yard hadn't been cut. I thought nobody lived there. Walked up to where the front door had been. It was kind of sitting off a little to the side. Now in my mind, I'm thinking, good, nobody lives here, which means, you got it, there aren't any dogs there. Dad knocked on where the door should have been on the side of it. Anybody home? Nobody answered. He waited a couple of minutes. He knocked again. Anybody home? Nobody answered. After a moment or two, we walked back down the sidewalk through the fence again, walking down the sidewalk toward the next house. Dad spotted them before I did. I spotted them before Dad did, but I knew he would. Out back of that house, there were some guys working on their motorcycles. They looked rough. But sure enough, we walked back around into the fence to the back of the house. There's old lean to they're working on it, seven or eight of them. They were rough. Beer cans were scattered around. They looked nasty. The language wasn't very good. Dad walked up to who I'm convinced to this day was the biggest one of them and said, Hello, I'm Jerry Jenkins. He smashed, he flashed that big Jerry Jenkins grin. He said, From the Woodline Church of Christ, we're out today inviting people to study the Bible. We found most people like to study the Bible. Would you like to study the Bible with us? And in my mind, I'm thinking Jerry A. Jenkins, born January 15th, 1930. Somebody's got to write the obituary. This guy's going to kill him. The guy kind of looked hard at him after a minute. He said, you know, my mama used to read me the Bible when I was a kid. I'll take your course. Completed all nine lessons. At the end of it, Dad took him the signed certificate, framed, presented it to him. Invited him to see the Joe Miller film strips. Agreed to. And then the fourth one, Dad, asked him that question. Is there any reason I should not baptize you this very night in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins that you can be a simple New Testament Christian? The man said he wanted to be baptized and Dad baptized him. Wednesday night, just a normal Wednesday night, I was sitting on the second row right there where Zane's sitting. I know I was sitting there because Mom and Dad had a policy. You can sit anywhere in the church building as long as it's in front of us. And they sat on the third row. So I was sitting there with Jeff and Timmy and Keith. And this guy walked in. And he looked rough. Long, dirty hair, greasy hands, a jacket with a t-shirt on underneath it, blue jeans. You didn't dress up when going to church when I was growing up. He stood out. Sat on the back row. Sunday showed up again. Next Wednesday again. Sunday again. He started cleaning himself up a little bit. Cutting his hair some. Eventually I had a burr haircut. His hair, he moved a little closer. He was all in near the front. And then one Wednesday night, he wasn't there. In his absence that Wednesday night was as conspicuous as his presence had been the first time he walked in that building. 
We sang one song. Brother Jonathan Victory started the second song. And the second verse of the second song that Wednesday night before we went to class, the back doors opened and in walked a motorcycle guy. And right behind him was another guy that looked as rough as he did the first time he had walked in. In a few weeks, that guy was baptized. And then another, and then another. And I don't know the number, but somewhere on nine of those guys became Christians. and formed an amazing group of men. And I tell you that story for two reasons. One, I'm proud of my dad, but that's not a reason to tell it in a sermon. There's another reason. To show you the power of the gospel in the lives of people. Folks, we are not bankers. We're not in the pre-qualification business. And that person you see that you think is most is least amenable to the gospel, oh, they're all tatted up and they don't look like they'd be interested at all. They're mad at the world. They're this or they're that or they're everything a Christian is not. I want to tell you something. They are looking for something. And I want to tell you something else. They don't know what they're looking for. And I want to tell you one more thing. You have what they're looking for. The gospel. And it can change their life just like it changed your life. And if it didn't change your life, you need to let it change your life today. And if it changed your life, it can change their life. We've got to be, we've got to avoid pride and partiality. And that gets in the way it kills churches. But a growing church, constantly looking for people that we can tell others about Christ. This morning, if you're not a Christian, it is great news long today. I apologize for that. But there's not a person here that would be upset to prolong this service so that you have the right, the opportunity to be baptized into Christ. Every Christian here would be delighted about that. Today, if you're not a Christian, we will help you with that. If you're a Christian, you're away from God, would you come home? Will you come? Always stand and sing.
want to thank you for your kind attention. I know I went a little longer than normal today, and I apologize for all that. I do that sometimes. Uh, back home, they call me Pharaoh because I won't let God's people go. Uh, <laughs> maybe you heard about the preacher one time that was preaching, and the sermon went really long, and somebody got up and left. The boy got up and left, and the preacher said, Son, where are you going? He said, I'm going to get a haircut. The guy said, why didn't you think of that before church? He said, I didn't need one then. So, uh, This is the longest sermon I will preach this week. Uh, thank you for your kindness as I've done it and for your attention. Look forward to studying a little bit later. Following song, we'll have some closing remarks and our closing prayer. There is the God, the answer, blue, our God.
Once again, thank you all for being here and make sure you remember in your prayers all those that are hurting spiritually and physically amongst us. The flyers at the back that don't have the bulletin in the middle, grab some of those, hand them out to your friends, your neighbors, uh, invite three people, and if we run out, I can make more, okay? Pass them out to your friends and your neighbors on Facebook, share this that was put up by the church page, and you can share the YouTube of the lessons from today. All right, after services, we're going to be having a potluck meal. There is more food than we can ever eat, so we need everyone to eat. Uh, after that, please come back. Our meeting is going to continue at 1.15 today, and every night this week, it will be at 6.30 p.m. until Wednesday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Invite people. Our closing prayer will be by Brother Kendall Hunt. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Our Father in Heaven, we are truly thankful for this privilege and opportunity that we've had to worship you, the true and the we thank you for Brother Dale, and we ask that you be with him in this meeting, and, you, and we ask that you be with us in this meeting also, that we might invite others. We pray for the success of this gospel meeting. Father, we thank you for being our God, for loving us even to the point of giving your only begotten Son for our sins. We ask, Father, that you be with us in our daily walk of life, that we might Project a Christ living in us. We ask, Father, that you go with us through the rest of this day and through the rest of this gospel meeting. We ask, Father, that you watch over and care for us and forgive us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.